Mons Tech Global. There's no problem so small that you can't solve it with a monster. Do you want a dog but only once a month at a full moon? Then get one of our werewolves. Are you afraid of garlic in your food? Then hire one of our vampires. And does your tap keep leaking? Well, for that one, you can probably just get a human plumber. But for everything else, Mons Tech Global. Hello, I'm up to no good CEO of Mons Tech Global. And I'm here to tell you that rumours of experiments being out of control are just wrong. And tonight, in the interests of transparency, we're allowing access all areas where no door is out of bounds. Apart from this door. And the basement. And the third floor. Tonight, my team will be demonstrating the kind of harmless and innocent experiments that we conduct all in the name of monster solutions. Yes, sometimes we hear ghoulish howls in the middle of the night. Yes, sometimes experiments escape. And yes, an awful lot of the scientists are allergic to garlic. But as you can see, we got nothing to hide. Our experiments are so safe, we want you to follow along at home. But please, please, please ensure you have adult supervision. And now for our first demonstration of the evening. We'll be going to Professor Polly to Geist, and she'll be showing us how we can see ghosts. But there has been a slight hiccup. One of her ghosts has escaped, and we need your help to find it. If you see this ghost throughout the night, we need you to tell us how many times you spot it. It'll be throughout the building, and during our workshops as well. And if you give us the correct answer in our comments, you stand a chance of winning our grand prize. And now, time for Professor Polly to Geist. Hello, my name is Polly Teargeist, Professor Polly Teargeist, and I'm the lead researcher for Ghost and Apparition Studies. Um, in this training session, I'm going to show you um, how you can train your eyes to actually see ghosts using an amazing phenomenon called after image. Ghosts are tricky creatures and like to, they like to pop up when you least expect it. The trick is to get them to, get them to go away, is to stare at them without blinking. I'm going to give you a challenge. In a moment, you're going to see a green ghost that will appear on the screen. I would like you to stare at the ghost for a few seconds. Stare at the ghost's eye. Try not to blink. Don't move your eyes and hopefully the ghost will disappear. Ready? Okay. Here we go. Stare at the ghost's eye. Don't look away. You did it! The ghost ran away. But did you see another ghost? What did you see? Was it the same ghost? Did it change colour? Yes! It was a different colour, wasn't it? It was a purpley pink colour. Magenta. That image that you saw was created by your mind. What you saw was something that we call after image. Let's explore this amazing effect some more. Okay, let's try this again. Here I have a white piece of paper. On this paper there is a yellow dot. You'll notice I've also marked a little black mark in the middle. This time we're going to stare at this dog for 20 seconds and then we'll spot it with a white piece of card. This time I want you to make a prediction. What do you think will happen? What will you see in the place of the yellow dot? Say it out loud. Ready? Here we go. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, keep staring, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 
30, 40, 50, 16, keep staring, 18, 19, almost down to 20. <gasps> what did you see? A balloon circle, that's right. So what do you think is happening? Let's explore even further. In the back of your eye, in your retina, you have millions of receptors called holes that detect color. But you only have three types, red, blue, and green. All the colors that we see are caused by these three receptors being stimulated in various proportions. If you look at something green, like her ghost from earlier, your green receptors are stimulated, and that sends a signal to your brain that says, I see green. <laughs> in this case, we're looking at something that was yellow, we don't have a receptor for yellow. We, uh, when you see yellow, you stimulate your green and red receptors. When those are stimulated, your brain says, I see yellow. <laughs> when we look at something white, like our paper, we stimulate all three of our cones, all three of our cones equal. So why did we see that after image? We know that when you stared at the green ghost, you stimulate the green receptors. If you stare for a long enough time, you start to get tired. When we swapped to the white screen, we would hope to stimulate all three cones, but since our green cones were tired, only the blue and red send the strongest signal. And mixing blue and red together make a purpley pink color. And that's why we saw the purpley pink after image. Similarly, um, with the yellow dot, our red-green receptors get tired. And then the after image, the blue receptors send the strongest signal. And we see a blue dot. You can try this at home. All you'll need is an assortment of different color pens maybe coloured stickers, white paper, or even coloured paper. Try other shapes. I've made a skull, um, a bat, and a ghost. Now the best thing to do is try and make a prediction of what you'll see afterwards. Have fun ghost hunting, and remember, don't blink. Thank you, Professor Polly to Geist. I'm still up to no good. And as you can see, we've got absolutely nothing to hide. We're even willing to admit that we've lost one of our ghosts. And what? Who left this vat of ghostly goo around? Someone with worse balance could have fallen over. Luckily though, I'm proud to admit that I haven't fallen over in nearly two years. Someone else who isn't prone to falling over is our resident adventurer, Trudy Departed. Come to think of it, she might be quite good at helping us catch that ghost. Remember, keep your eyes peeled. Trudy! Good evening. My name is Trudy Departed and here is my laboratoire at Monstech Global. Now I have dedicated my life to studying the periodic table and on this ghastly and ghoulish evening I would like to share with you one of its deepest, darkest secrets, the periodic table. These are evil elements from mysterious monsters. It is my life's work that I will share with you tonight. Now, our very first element comes from one of my favorite creatures, dragons. Famous for two things, fire and hoarding. Now, dragon saliva, known to myself and other scientists of my ilk, as Dragonium is very thick, very, very flammable. In fact, I have some right here, this dragon-sized vial. Now, Dragonium, or dragon saliva, is usually lit uh, when dragons grind their teeth together to create a spark. Now, I don't have any dragon teeth with me today, apart from one deeply embedded in my leg, uh, but I do have means of creating a spark uh, with this candle lighter right here. Now bear with me, you will experience a little bit of darkness uh, for this experiment to work. In three, two, one. Now 
Dragonium. Very powerful stuff. You may have seen earlier this evening my uh, esteemed colleague Polly Geist uh, working with some ghosts and ghouls that we have um, perfectly contained here within this building. Uh, in fact, Polly was kind enough to lend me uh, one of these spirits to showcase my very next element, Demon Oxide. It's a powerful, powerful substance uh, from the horns of demons. And when used correctly, I can actually capture a ghost like the one I have inside this bottle. Uh, don't worry, it's perfectly under control. It's a little Category 5 fellow, uh, somewhere between Casper and a full-on exorcist situation. Um, but don't worry, uh, I do need to release it uh, to get it back to Polly. Uh, I said I was only going to borrow it for a minute. Um, it, you, you know how to get back to Polly's, do you? Third door on the left? The left? My left. You'll figure it out. Uh, so, we'll be releasing this ghost. Uh, please cover uh, your mouth, nose, ears, any, anywhere it can get in and possess you. And in three, two, one. <laughs> now, our next element that I would like to showcase to you is Unicorn Ivium. This one is actually the tears of a unicorn. Very difficult to get. Try find a unicorn that's recently stubbed its hoof. Uh, but Unicorn Ivium has memory. Very fascinating element. When it reacts with fire, create something quite spectacular. Do need to contain it. Add a little bit in here. Little bit in here. And set it light. Now, as I said, Unicornithium has memory. And when added to fire, it's capable of remembering the unicorn it was harvested from. You can see, it produced the shape of its horn. Fascinating stuff. Now we have created a lot of light using our elements from the theoretic table. But that light has always been in the form of fire, accompanied by a great burst of heat. There is one element, however, capable of creating light without heat. We call this therium. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, Trudy, we love fairies. They're so pretty and elegant, flapping around the forest and granting wishes to the little children. I will tell you this now. Fairies are vicious little creatures. They will take your nose clean off. I know what you've done, Tinkerbell. I know what you're capable of, and I won't be intimidated into silence. Fairies tend to glow when they eat their favorite snack. Spiders. I have some liquid therium right here, and I do have some crushed spiders. Um, I prefer to use house spiders. Uh, if you don't have any, store bought is fine. But when we add spiders to the therium, has the exact same effect as when they move through the digestive system. 
So let's see how it glows when you react to them together. And there we have it, positively revolting. Finally, this evening, it will be discussing the only creature, Mina, more vile than the fairy. This last element comes from the ogre. They are big, mean, rather smelly, Terrible mustaches, quite like our CEO, up to no good. Uh, but quite like Upton's well, ogre farts are magical. And when collected inside a balloon, do not ask, they float. Now there is quite a lot of energy uh, within an ogre fart, within some ogreon, as we call it. In fact, I believe one single ogreon emission, one single fart, could power an entire city. So allow me to demonstrate by releasing the energy by igniting this balloon. One moment, please. And in three, two, one. And there you have it. Uh, my life's work presented a to you uh, for your appraisal. I do wonder, what if we mix them all together? E e each has a unique property, of course, but just a, a dash of dragonium, a drop of demon oxide, a unit of unicornivium, a fifth of ferium, and an ounce of ogreon. One moment, please. Thank you, Trudy Departed. I'm still up to no good and you might be thinking I was just accosted by some zombies, but let me assure you this is just a fashion choice. Wearing two shoes is very Halloween 2019. Um, what I will say though is this cupboard looks very inviting, doesn't it? I think we should, come on, get in the cupboard, quick. Oh, it's occupied. Oh. I think they think we're in a toilet and not a cupboard and definitely not zombies out there. And actually while we're waiting for the definitely not zombies to get tired and leave us alone, um, we've got another demonstration that you can join in with at home. It's with Crispy Skull, our resident ghostly goo expert. Actually, do you think he's the one leaving the vats of ghostly goo about? I nearly fell into one. Well, well we're gonna go quick, Crispy Skull, enjoy. Here at Monstead, we also study things that matter. Things like mass, particles and materials. All things to do with matter. Speaking of matter, we have this mysterious matter here that has some fascinating properties. 
Now some matter comes in the form of a solid, some in the form of a liquid, and some in the form of a gas. But what if there was matter that could be more than one of these things at the same time? Well, let's investigate that further. But before we can get to our mysterious material, we need to discuss the three states of matter. The first state of matter is solid. Now a solid is something that has a definite size and a definite shape, like this table right here. It's the same size all the time, and it's the same shape all the time. Liquids, however, have a definite size, but they don't have a definite shape. So in here, we've got around about 250 milliliters of red water in the spherical flask. So it maintains the shape of a sphere, but when I pour it into this conical flask, like so, the volume stays exactly the same, but the shape's now gone from a sphere into a cone. Now a gas, oh, 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 a gas doesn't have any definite size or any definite shape. The air around us is a gas, and what it does is it expands to fill the container that it's in. The gas has expanded all the way to fill this room. That's the size and that's the shape of it. It's the size of whatever container it's in. Now there are some materials that aren't easily classified as solid, liquid, or gas. They manage to be more of these things, two of these things, maybe even three of these things at the same time. Now one of these things that we have are called non-Newtonian fluids. Fluids that don't act like the way we'd expect them, because when we look at them, they look like a liquid, but they're gonna act like a solid. And we're actually gonna make a non-Newtonian substance right now. We're gonna make something fantastic called Ublek. It's an easy, simple recipe that you can follow along at home. So to make oobleck, you're gonna need some corn flour, you're gonna need some water, you're gonna need a big bowl, and you're gonna need something to stir that all with. You also could use some food coloring as well to make it nice and colorful and vibrant. That's just gonna make it a whole lot more fun. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna add our corn flour to our bowl. There we go, add some in there. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna slowly add some water. As we're adding the water, we're gonna start to give it a stir. What you wanna do is you wanna make sure that all these lumps and bumps of corn flour are starting to get mixed up into the water. You're just gonna keep mixing it. At this point, you might just wanna add your food coloring as well to give it that nice, lovely color. So we're gonna add some food coloring right there. There we go. You just start stirring that in. And you're gonna to start to feel that it's gonna become harder and harder to stir as you carry on. If you feel like you want to make some more oobleck, you don't think that's enough, then you just throw in some more corn flour, throw in a little bit more water, and just keep on stirring. But eventually, you're going to come up with this fantastic substance right here, that as you're stirring it, it looks like a liquid, but it feels like you're stirring through something solid. And what you can do afterwards is you can pick it up in your hands, and you can watch it run through. If you squeeze it in your hands, you're able to catch it and it flows a lot slower. So just give that another bash, just kind of try and pick some of that up in your hand, and there you go, you may be able to pass it through your hands as well. As you can see, flowing like a liquid, but then stopping like a solid. All fluids have a property called viscosity, which is the rate that a fluid will flow. Now a Newtonian fluid, like water, will flow at a constant rate. Doesn't matter how you pour it or what you pour it through, it's gonna flow at exactly the same rate. However, oobleck is gonna flow at different rates, and that all depends on how much pressure is applied on it. When it's in my hand and I don't grip on, it just flows right through like a liquid. But when I pick some up and grab it quite tight, it flows a lot slower as it starts to feel more like a solid. Now, what color of oobleck did you all make at home? And what fun things have you done with it? One fun thing you can do with your oobleck is roll it in a ball in your hands. As you're rolling it in your hands, it feels like a ball. But if you slow down, it becomes a liquid again. One other fun thing you can do is you can put it in nice and slowly, because you're not applying much force, so it stays as a liquid. But then when you try and lift it out, it's stuck! Oh my goodness, it's stuck! Oh, this is the worst thing to happen! Ah!
Thank you very much, Crispy Skull. Although I'm not quite sure why you need to make so much ghostly goo. Someone could fall into that, have a terrible accident. Not myself, of course. I'm very good at balancing and... Did, did you hear that? Professor Polly to Geist. Tr Trudy departed? Crispy Skull? Well, I've got one more employee left to introduce to you. Um, it's Dr. Lars Intestin, um, and he's one of the greatest reanimators of the human body. Now, he's promised me that doesn't mean zombies. Um, but um, while he does that, I'll, I'll just... Dr. Lars Intestin says you're not allowed to eat me! Yes, 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 what? Oh, yes, uh, hello, hello there. <laughs> I didn't quite see you uh, creeping around. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, hello, my name is Dr. Lars Intestine, yes, and, and welcome, please, uh, to my uh, wonderful lab here, yes. Now, uh, according to Upton, uh, we are going to be showing a little bit of what we do here at Monstech. Yes, just to prove, just to disprove all of those awful, awful pieces of rumour that something fishy and something odd is going on. Yes, yes. And right here in the zombie labs, I mean regular labs, yes, we have been working on healthcare, yes, on helping the human race. You see, on my studies I have found that there are two very important organs. One of them helps oxygen get inside, and the other one pumps blood all around your body. That is indeed the lungs and the heart. So, I thought for today we would do a little bit of a lung and heart dissection, yes. <laughs> now, we will be dissecting real organs today as well. So, um, if those of you at home are feeling a little bit uh, squeamish, don't feel like you have to stay around. Maybe pop to the bathroom, maybe, you know, go and see something else. Come back in 10 minutes. But for those of you who are a little bit braver, well, let me introduce you to uh, <laughs> today's courses, yes. So, starting with our lungs. <laughs> yes, these are our lungs, and as you can see, they are quite the size, yes. Mm. Large surface area because we need to be able to breathe in a lot of oxygen to help our body work, yes. So, as you can see, if you're having trouble finding your own lungs, all you need to do is pop your arms out like you're going to give somebody a big old hug and then pop your hands in. Pop them on your chest, have a big deep breath in, and if you felt your chest rise, those are your lungs expanding and contracting to allow all that oxygen in. But enough chit-chat about your ones. We're talking about these ones on our table here. Yes, yes, yes. Now, I'm going to take my surgical scissors. We're going to start exploring, yes. What we're going to do is we're going to start with this long tube here. This is what we call our trachea, yes. And this is what connects your mouth to your lungs themselves. So I'm going to have a little snip down the centre here. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Cut down here. You might see this curious white stuff here all along the edge and all along here. This is what we call cartilage. Yes, yes. And this is uh, the same stuff that's in your nose and the same stuff that's in your ears and allows our trachea here or our windpipe to maintain its shape. Yes, you don't want to be closing that off anytime soon because you very much need oxygen. As you see, it's this very, very strong material here. And it's all of these individual rings that runs down. It's kind of why it looks like at the edge here, looks a little bit like baby teeth. Mm, yes, how gruesome. <laughs> yes. Now, if I cut off just a small segment at the top here, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, there we are. You'll be able to see that C shape just an awful lot clearer. Yes, yes. Like that there. Very, very lovely. Anyway, put that to the side and we'll continue cutting. And we'll get to a point in our lungs. There. There we are. <laughs> yes. Uh, you will see it almost looks a little bit like a pig's nose inside. Yes, 
because that is where our trachea separates into our left bronchi and our right bronchi, yes. Now, if you imagine these two bronchi like big sponges that you get in your kitchen, yes. Lots of little holes and travels and passages inside, yes. If I cut into our right bronchi here, you're going to start seeing lots of little passages revealing themselves. And having more of these passages, you're giving your lungs more surface area, and that allows more oxygen to get into your bloodstream and around your body, yes. I cut some more, yes, 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 and you're seeing more of this cartilage along the sides here as well. Now, if you were here as well, you'd be able to feel that the bronchi are quite spongy. Yes, yes, very, very spongy because of, because of the fact that these little channels here go deeper and deeper and deeper and further and further and further. It's almost like there's all these tiny little passages all over this thing. And uh, remember before when I got you to breathe in and you felt your lungs expand? Well, hopefully I'll be able to show this to you as well because I have a little device here as well. And if I am able to plug this into our remaining bronchi, yes, yes, oh, very good fit there. And let's give it a whirl, yes. And, uh, yes, yes, rise, rise, rise! <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm just getting a little carried away there. Uh, yes. Where was I? Yes, our lungs. Now, you might have gotten the stomach for this side of things, but this is actually the back of our lungs here. Far more gruesome tail is on the front of our lungs. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. oh, very, very nasty stuff. Uh, thankfully, this is the result of some very fine work. Some other people have been preparing this for me. As you can see, one of the main things that you'll be noticing is this large material here. Yes, yes, yes. This whole space here. Now, very, very thin, very, very transparent membrane. Now, beforehand, another organ sat inside of here, right in the center. And this material here is what we call the pericardium or the pericardial sac. This is, of course, where our heart used to stick, right in the center there. But I hear some of you at home saying, but Lars, isn't your heart towards the left of your body and not in the center, as this would say? Well, well, my dear viewers, unfortunately, that is a little bit of a scientific myth. Your heart lives right in the center of your body, underneath a very strong piece of bone. Uh, it is on my theory that vampires had shared that idea everywhere so that people couldn't stick them in the heart. And if they did, well, it would be to the left. It would absolutely miss them. I've met a couple of vampires in my time and, and uh, I've um, read about them in books. Yes, never, never, never once I interacted with one of them. Never. That is not a thing that's ever happened. Yes, uh, the heart then. Yes, we will move on to our next organ. Yes, indeed. Now, as you can see, it's a much smaller, neater package in comparison to our lungs. Yes, yes, far more delicate to this one. Uh, an adult's heart is about the size of your fist. If you feel clenched that together, you'll see it's a very similar scale to our heart here as well. Now, some of you might be more familiar with the drawing of the heart, the very, very cute sort of image of something like this, with this little bumpy bit at the top. But as you can see, the real heart looks nothing like it. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very alien and different. One of the only similarities between the two is that our hearts and the cartoon heart that you see here has two separate chambers, uh, a left side and a right side, yes. So I think that's enough chit chat. I think it's time to start cutting open this thing here, yes. So uh, to find the left and right side, I've got to do something rather gruesome and um, pop my thumbs inside so there's uh, have a feel around and, ah, uh, oh, yes, 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 there we are. Far thicker wall on this side, but we'll come back to that later. So trusty scissors, oh, go away. Each half of our heart here is separated into two separate chambers. This spot here that looks a little bit like a spooky forest, that is what we call the right 
atrium, yes, yes. Think of it like the entranceway to a building, that's where we get the name from. And after every entranceway to a building, there is a door, which in this case is this funny little creature here. Yes, yes, this is what we call our tricuspid valve. Now, Lars, why would you have a door inside a heart? Well, it's very important that all your blood flows in a single direction. And this valve or door here prevents blood moving backwards, you see. It's a one-way system that's very, very important for oxygen to travel around your body. So once this valve has opened and allowed the blood to transport itself into the bottom part of our heart here, this is what we call our ventricle. You'll also see that there is a small passage around the back. And if I take my handy tweezers here and pop them through the back, uh, we'll be able to find uh, uh, where, yes, our outlet. You see, our vent ventricle wall will contract, allowing blood to flow out the back, like so, just like that. Yes, there we are. Now, this part that my tweezers are poking out of, this is what we call our pulmonary artery. And the reason why our lungs are so close to our heart is because this is where all the blood comes from the heart into the lungs. Lungs full of oxygen, which then diffuses into your blood, is then pushed through that into the pulmonary vein and into the left side of our heart. Yes, indeed. So, it will go exactly the same as on our right side. It will go into an atrium and then into a ventricle once it's gone through a valve. Now, I've opened this one up for you to see. Something you might, the more eagle-eyed of you viewers might notice, is that the wall is much thicker on the left than it is the right. Now, if you think of it, this right-hand side only has to push blood to your lungs, a very, very short distance. The left-hand side of your heart has to push blood to all over your body, has to go to the tippy-tippy toes, to up to the tips of your fingers, yes. Much harder and much stronger process. So, that's why the wall here is much thicker, a much stronger part of our heart, yes. <clears throat> so, exactly the same as on our right. You are seeing we have a spooky forest representing our atrium, a valve here, which prevents backflow of blood, and then our ventricle down at the bottom. And exactly the same, we'll have a little passage underneath that goes out to what we call our aorta. And that is the, that is the vessel that transports blood to the rest of our body. So, we have blood going to our lungs and blood going to the rest of our body, but there's one part of our body that isn't getting any blood. And that is, of course, the heart itself. Yes, a very, very strong part, but it still needs a blood supply itself. So, if I cut open this, you see our heart, it's thought of everything. It's a very, very smart organ. And it has this tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny little gap here that we call our coronary artery. It's got its own little valve we call a semilunar valve because it looks a little bit like the moon. A blood moon. And um, this is where all of the blood will then slowly but surely seep into the heart to allow it to have its own supply of oxygen. Very important indeed to consider that this organ beats a hundred thousand times a day. So very, very strong and very, very important indeed. Our heart here, yes. Well, I think that about covers it for our uh, small introduction to what we do here in the zombie labs. Uh, I mean, the, the uh, health regeneration program here at uh, Monstech. So, um, if you don't mind, uh, the door is that way. I'll let you see yourself out, yes. Uh, oh, that's right, yes, you're a, you're a camera. You, you, you can't see yourself out. Um, uh, I'm still up to no good, and there's been a slight reanimation issue with Dr. Oz's intestine, and I'm not scared or anything, but I'm... Yo, you should come with me as well. Let's, let's just head down here. Um, I just forgot my keys. Let's just go out! I found them! I found them!
found the keys. Oh, and as you can see, Monster Tech Global has absolutely nothing to hide. Everything is completely above. Would you look what I found? I found our wee friend. The guys won't profess a poly to guys be happy. Do you know how many times you managed to spot our ghost? Remember, if you let us know below, you could be in with a chance of winning our grand prize. Just pop and down for there. That's all from us tonight. Glasgow Science Centre is an educational charity, and we want to engage and inspire people from all walks of life with science. If you've enjoyed this evening's events, please consider making a donation and help us continue making science accessible for everyone. You can find a link to our donation page in the description below. I've been up to no good. I hope to see you all again very soon. Hello, I'm up to no good CEO of Monstech Global, and for the past few years, I've been harnessing the power of fruit and veg. You might have heard of a pineapple, albeit I didn't invent the pineapple, but I did find out it contains an enzyme that actually consumes the person that's eating it itself. It's not very effective, but my enemies have had a lot of very tasty Hawaiian pizzas. Onions? Yes, we've all heard of the onion, but do you know it makes you cry? I've been giving my opponents so many onions, they feel sorry for me. Those tears have led them to pity me and take advantage of their goodwill. <laughs> then of course there's lemons. You all know the phrase, when life gives you lemons, turn on the lights. Lemons are batteries. I'm using the lemon juice to power my evil enterprise. My overheads are lower than they've ever been. Evil has never been so affordable. <laughs> Can somebody turn the lights back on, please? It takes us to the pumpkin. What power does it hold? My nefarious plan is to see just how many elastic bands it takes to explode a single pumpkin. <laughs> then all I need to do is multiply that number by the number of pumpkins that exist in the world. <laughs> I'm unstoppable! There's no solution. There's no solution. Oh, okay. <laughs> same volume. It's volume. Volume. The same volume. Oh my goodness. What is a volume? <laughs> I just lost it there at the end. I don't need you, Link. No! <laughs> You're a camera. You can't see yourself out. Huh? You're watching Bake Off. I really think that, um, you know, Sura's got a good chance of winning this year. Yeah. Hello. I'm up to. <laughs> Sorry. I bowed juice on my fingers. I bowed juice on my That was a terrible fit of acting right there. <laughs> the pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs>
ko. Hey. <laughs> Pumpkins are one of your five a day. 